Shalom from here in the Holy Land. Welcome to Conversations with Yael podcast. I'm your host, Yael Eckstein, President and CEO of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. Each month, I will invite leading thought leaders, pastors, rabbis, and other influential guests to discuss the importance of Israel in the world today. For those familiar with my weekly podcast, Nourish Your Biblical Roots, which explores the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, this podcast takes that understanding and translates it into ongoing support for Israel among Christians and the critical need to nurture that support with the next generation of Christians. Join me now as we begin this important dialogue. Through my work with the fellowship, I've been honored to meet so many people who have devoted their lives to Israel. Politicians and public servants, journalists and writers, military veterans and Holocaust survivors, and their children. This week guest checks all of those boxes. I am so proud and honored to have on the podcast Yair Lapid, who served as Israel's 14th prime minister. In Israeli through and through, he was born and raised in Tel Aviv, the son of Israeli journalist and Holocaust survivor Tami Lapid and novelist Shulamit Lapid. A veteran of the Israel Defense Forces, he then followed his parents' footsteps, working as a newspaper editor and columnist, as well as publishing many books. He even used his creative talents as a songwriter. Aside from his talent with words, he has also devoted his life to Israel in the public realm, serving in the Knesset as finance minister, minister of foreign affairs, and most recently as prime minister of Israel. Prime Minister Lapid, thank you so much for joining thank you. us. Pleasure to be here. So I am a little bit starstruck mm -hmm. because <laughs> I read your words and to me, they speak to the heart of every Israeli, of mm -hmm. anyone who loves this country. You get to the bottom of it. And in reading the book that you published in 2011, Memories After My Death, you didn't write in your tone, but you wrote as if it was your father, telling his story from being a Holocaust survivor to being part of the founders of Israel and building Israel to what we know today. How did you get the idea to write in your father's voice? Well, it was just, I was going through a really long shiva. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is the Memorial Days in Judaism. And, um, you know, when I started writing the book, I thought I was writing the story of my father. And it took me a while before I realized I'm actually writing the story of Jewish, Jewish people in the 20th century. Yes. Uh, because of what you have mentioned. Because he was this kid in, in, in Eastern Europe who, who grew up to a very bourgeois-like family, who, who felt he lives in this very solid world, the old world, and then everything collapsed in a moment, and he finds himself in the basement of the ghetto. Uh, his father was, was killed, was murdered in a concentration camp. And he survived miraculously, like because everybody who survived was survived miraculously. And then he comes to this country, and then, then the country is established, and he understands that this, his destiny was to be here. So I realized, it took me a while to understand that I'm writing the story of the Jewish people through my father. So I did it using his voice, because it was running in my head in a way. And it, is, it was my way of saying my farewells to him uh, while discussing what this country should be. Did you learn anything new about your father that you were researching for this book that you didn't know when he was alive? Well, I've learned a little about the the fact that he had more than one girlfriend before my mother. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he was he was a happy guy. Um, well, I knew my father was somebody who talked and write about his experiences of throughout his life. Yeah. So I mean, there was no huge surprise it's not like i mean no skeletons uh no uh, black boxes still we don't get the chance i suppose you feel the same with your father your late father to look through the history of our parents yeah. as something that is that is organized mm -hmm. so it was it was in a way it, it gave, I was privileged enough to understand my father's life as as a story. Yeah. Um, many people said before me that you know the the one thing that differentiated 
human species from others is the fact that we are storytellers. We understand life as a story. And, and now I understand his story, not only as a story as my father, but his story as a person, as, as, as a human being. I love that because something that stood out so much to me was how much he loved your mother True. and how much love and support you felt as children. And it's something that when my father died suddenly at the age of 67, I said he died too young, but I got everything that most people don't get from parents who live till 120. The love, the support, the knowledge that he's proud of me. There was something similar between our fathers. Yeah. They were bubbling. Mm. There were people with 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 passion for life, and yeah. people with passion uh, transfer this uh, to their children in mm. so many ways. I mean, you 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 are you are you are glued to the enthusiasm they have about life. I mean, so so yes, I I, I felt the similarities talking to your father. <laughs> Amazing, your father of blessed memory lived in a time of Zionism where he believed everyone had to come and contribute to the building of this land. It was very clear what needed to be done to bring the world that was, the world that he was living in, into the future, the world that we're experiencing now. It's very different in our time. What do you see as the foundations of Zionism today? Well, first of all, you're right. He told me once something that was curious to me, uh, he said, you Israelis don't understand Israelis, born Israelis, Sabres. You don't understand what war is. Mm. And I said, what do you mean? I mean, we had seven wars in this country. I, I remember the sirens growing up. He said, no, 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 this is not war. War is when 50,000 people dies in the first day. That's a war. So, and he, what he was trying to tell me is, you don't understand the fragility of the life you're living. You think this country is is something that goes without saying. You think it's uh, um, sustainable because it is, and you're so wrong about this. We have to understand this as a as a constant creation, as something you have to always uh, uh, build, and 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 you can never be too diligent mm. in in working on this country and and being part of it and servant of the the idea. That it uh, uh, embodies. Uh, so, so he felt this. He felt very strongly about the fact that we don't just live here. We have a part, and we are a part. And it took me a while to understand this is also a blessing because mm. we live in an era in, in, in which, you know, people just just you know they go for thirty years to the same pub just because somebody remembers the name, or or, or they, they I don't know they join a gang with blue bandanas and they kill people with red bandanas just because it's their group. And we have this as, as, as a birthright. Mm -hmm. we, we are part of something. We belong to something that is greater than us. And, and this, this makes our lives meaningful. And, and you cannot ask for more than meaningful life. Wow. So just by being here, just by living here, just being able to call this land home, mm -hmm. We're part of a nation, which is an identity that we've yearned for for 2,000 years. Yes. That and by being together, we have one another, despite our differences, simply by being here. Well, the differences is what creates this country. I mean, the, the ability to live with people you understand that are different from you is, is part of this, this unbelievable creation. Yeah. How has been... A, being a child of a Holocaust survivor in this modern era affected how you see your responsibility, both as a father, as a husband, and as a leader. Hmm. There is a story. It's my, my family's story. It's my story, even though I wasn't born when it happened. I mean, so it's the terrible winter of 1944-45. And uh, my father is a kid in this ghetto, in the basement in the ghetto. There are approximately 600 people in this basement. The Russians are approaching Budapest. And the Germans are trying, uh, starting to take the Jews out in death convoys. And they're taking them to the Danube River and they're shooting them into the water. And the Danube was red in the city. And one very early Monday morning, they, they're surrounding my father's the building my father was in, and they're taking all the 600, and they're walking. And they know that they are walking towards their death. They know, they understand this. 
And at a certain point, an airplane lowered over this, this convoy. And for two minutes, there was tremor and people were yelling and shouting and shooting and the Germans shooting the Schmeisser machine guns into the air. And my grandmother saw a small green, painted in green public lavatory. And she pushed my father inside. My father was 13 at the time. And she said, you have to pee now. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's difficult. If, if you're 13 and it's freezing and people are shouting and you know you're going to die and you're scared. But he did. He was a good kid. So he was pretending to pee and she, she walked behind him. She closed the door and the convoy left without him. And six minutes later, from the 600 people, 598 were dead in the water, bodies floating in the water. And there was quiet, and they left, they opened the door, and there was nothing there. And they realized that they are free, but they have nowhere to go to. And you think of it, the world was as vast as it is now. In, in, in the American Midwest, you can drive for six hours without meeting a soul. You can, I flew once from in Australia, from Melbourne to Perth, five hours. I didn't see, see a single soul from the airplane's window. So they went back to the ghetto because they had no other place to go to. And many years later, early 80s, I went with my father to Budapest. And we, he was happy to go back. He was, he, was, he was a big eater, so he was happy with the restaurants <laughs> and the music and the people and the, enjoyed the language. So we were just strolling down the street. And suddenly he looks at something and he starts crying. And I said, Dad, what? And he said, look at this. Look. I said, what? It's, I, I see nothing. He said, look at this. Look at this. And I'm looking and there's an empty street with a small public lavatory painted in green. Wow. It is still there. I, yeah, I, I, last time I was in Budapest, I went to, to, to there to make sure it's. I'm, I'm the only person I know who's doing pilgrimage to public love. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, so and when he when he got his senses back, he told me so. This is this is where my Zionism was born, wow. because I realized I have to have a place to go to. I cannot live in a in a world in which I don't have a place to go. So it is our duty to make sure this place always, always exists. Wow. It's so meaningful. We, we made Aliyah, my husband and I, after we got married in 2005, and we have four children who were born here. And for my daughter's bat mitzvah um, five years ago, I brought her to Ukraine. Mm. And one of the most meaningful things was standing and overlooking Babiar. Yeah. and telling her, this is why we picked up our life in America and moved to Israel. This is why you're going to join the IDF. This is why we need a homeland, because there's nowhere else that we have a government and an army, and the only sole objective of both of them is protecting you. This is so true. Yeah. You know, when as, as Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, whenever I, 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 I met uh, foreign leaders who were complaining about this and that, I always told them, you know, we have learned the hard way. No one will come. Yeah. If we will not be able to protect ourselves, no one will come to protect us. No one will come to save us. So I, I, it's okay to have criticism. I accept that. This yeah. is part of, of, of friendship. You are allowed to criticize. But I'm allowed to remember that uh, when push comes to shove, mm -hmm. we are going to be the ones who are protecting ourselves and nobody else. Yes. It leads to um, my next question, that uh, when I hear about all these stories of your father and the Holocaust and going back and marking those footsteps and standing by Babi Yar with my daughter, I always think about how there are two things that I see in this day and age that's very different than before 1948. Um, and one of those is that we have a state of Israel, someone to go, somewhere to go to. When we survive and just want to go home, there's a homeland that's mm -hmm. waiting for us. And the second is that we have, for the first time in history, millions of Christian friends who stand with us. The fellowship has millions of uh, donors, supporters, people who pray for us, who support us, and who really say Israel has to stand on their own two feet and make their own decisions. The fellowship is non-political and simply here to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and, and help with Aliyah from non-Western countries. So I'm wondering, how do you feel about Christian support for Israel? Well, I have a personal debt. Um, I don't know how much of this you know. 
about the kind of relation I've developed with your father around this subject. I have a daughter with special needs. And when she was, I don't know, four, even 14 or something like this, all of a sudden, I became aware for the first time in my life to the possibility that I will die one day, which is, which is okay. I mean, everybody dies. But then I, I said to myself, okay, who, who's going to take care of her? Right. right now, I said to myself, I'm not allowed to die. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was looking around to see if, the, if there's any uh, houses, what they call house for life here yeah. in, in, in Israel. I don't know, is there an American term for this? For special needs adults in order yeah. to have that independence and care. So, um, and I realized there's not a single one here in the vast Tel Aviv era. Yeah. So uh, I decided we're going to build one. And one of the first phone calls I made was to your father. And uh, we sat in a coffee place in Tel Aviv, and I said to him, you have to explain to me this, this, this story of the foundation. How does this work? And he told me the story about this commitment of all these great, unbelievable Christian friends of Israel. And he said, this is why we have created this foundation. This is why we are here. And, and he was the one single most prominent figure in building this house. My daughter lives there now oh. with 23 other, uh, they're not children anymore, they're young people. It's an unbelievable place. Um, I don't feel like dying, but I'm allowed to. <laughs> um, there are and, many people who would disagree. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Anyway, I mean, so through this, through my my, my very personal fear and and, and emotion, mm -hmm. I I learned about this this friendship and, and warmth that comes from afar that we are we are so grateful for and um, and I, I also think this this allows us to I mean this is this is this is an ongoing story this friendship this doesn't stay you, you started your question by talking about the fact the way we left the Holocaust we left the Holocaust not with one uh, uh, lesson but with two one is, yes, we need to survive, and we need to survive. We need to have our own army. We need to have our own country. We need to have the ability to protect ourselves. But there's another lesson to be learned from the Holocaust, is that we need to be moral people. Mm. And morality is tested only in, a ver in very immoral moments or, or hours or in, in, in the life of a nation. And this, the, these moral standards is something we share with our Christian friends. This is the famous Judeo-Christian uh, uh, way of looking at life that we share, which is extremely important. Beautiful. As you talk, you are so cultured, you're so mm -hmm. exposed to so many different societies, you're so um, strong in your beliefs and your thoughts are ever evolving. Do you have one role model as you are growing up that you attribute, besides your father, of course, and your mother, I know as well, mm -hmm. um, to bringing you to where you are today? I'm not sure you can have only one or two. I think part of it is being able... I mean, I'm... I'm um, I mean, I, I, I'm a great, I'm, I'm a constant reader of Edmund Burke and other. Uh, they're, they're not really because it's it's the old school liberals who are considered today conservative uh -huh. uh, uh, thinkers. Um, but if if I'm uh, somebody asks me and and well, what is the book you really read most in your life? So it's the Bible, uh -huh. which I still fight with. I I mean, I can go and have a fight uh, three rounds with Jeremiah or. or lose by points to, to uh, Joshua. I mean, it's, it's um, but this is, this is the book that I'm, I'm going back to as, as a way of life. Um, I'm, 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 a, I'm an autodidact, so, so, but I'm, so I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a devoted reader um, of philosophy, of history. I, I was really close to Rabbi Jonathan Zachs, you know who he is? Of course. Yeah. Uh, he was the only person I called my rabbi, mm -hmm. In my life, so I'm so it is many of us, many of us. Yes. <laughs> so I'm happy to hear. What is it about the Bible that captivates you? Mm. The ability to teach 
through great storytelling and letting you letting the the, the conclusions evolve in, within you instead of just telling you mm-hmm. what, um, what I mean there is the part of telling you what is right and what is wrong which is I mean but if you look at this I've dedicated most of my life to to writing you look at the Ten Commandments okay so this is in the Hebrew version which is the original one 176 words it's a paragraph okay if you put it it's, it's a small part this is 176 words change the word more than all the Jets, tanks, and and cannons combined. Just by being able to approach so many souls at the same time. And the other thing I really love about the Bible, and this, this is being the secular that I am, is the fact that they, unlike later writings, the Bible never tries to hide all the human flaws of those great characters we follow. Uh, the fear of Abraham, the the doubt. I mean, Moses was a doubter. He's somebody who had doubts all his life. Um, the anger of Samuel. Oh, I mean, this this is this this makes it real to me. And besides, I live here. I mean, I go to Jerusalem every day on on four three three road, right. which is the exact route where King Saul goes to look for his father's donkeys. So it's part of my life. Amazing, amazing. Whenever I meet world leaders, I always think of Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama mm-hmm. just getting up and laughing together, making jokes. Do you have any world leaders that you feel that connection with or any really funny stories that you can share with us? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the funny stories we keep to ourselves. I have some world leaders who are friends. Emmanuel Macron of France is a friend. Boris Johnson of, of England, who left premiership uh, recently, who's a, who's a funny guy. Um, uh, President Biden was was is 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 we're friendly with. He's, he was gracious enough to call my son when my son got married to bless him, and then invited him to the White House. We were very proud of this. So uh, um, you know, when I, when I became a politician, and I almost immediately became a finance minister. Um, I realized now I can meet all the people I always read about and ask them the questions. You usually don't ask. So I I asked everyone I met the same question. I said, okay, which advice would you give your young self? Mm-hmm. And from all the, and I got some great advice from, from so many people, but I think the best advice I got from John McKay, the late John McKay, who was a great man. And he said, he said, you know, in politics, people always tell you that you have to have some small compromise for the bigger cause. Mm-hmm. And then the bigger cause never comes, and you are stuck with the bitterness of of small making compromise. the small compromise. Don't make the small compromise. Just do what you believe in, and if there are consequences, deal with them. And this was an unbelievable advice of a very smart man. Mr. Prime Minister, what advice would you give to your younger self? <laughs> <laughs> to listen to John McCain, I guess. Um, it's it. I, I I'm sticking to this one. I, I I'm sticking to this one. Maybe I will add. <laughs> you know who Laurent Fabius was? No. He was he was Prime Minister of France in the age of thirty eight, and then he was he was uh, um, for when I met him he was Foreign Minister. He comes from a Jewish family, and he said, "Make time for yourself." And I said, "Sure." And he said, "No, no, no, no you don't understand. When you are going into these kind of positions, there's so many people on your schedule." And if you let them, you will work 24 hours a day and then you will never have a chance to think. And thinking is the most important part of our job. So make sure you make some time to think in each and every day. So I'm making some time to think each and every day. Well, sometimes while driving. He was a brilliant man. Yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant. Actually, I've been hearing a few people say, my only fear of Yair Lapid being too involved in politics is that he won't have time to write. <laughs> I, you know what? You're, I, I, don't, I don't write as much as I should have these days because we, I'm, so, I'm so tangled up in all the things, especially in these very stormy days. Well, um, your time is so precious, and I so appreciate you giving a, a few minutes to us. I'm going to end with the same question that I ask to everyone that I interview. Who is a biblical character that you learn the most from? And if there is a verse that you have in front of your eyes as you go about your important and world-changing daily mm. business? 
I will have to go with Moses yeah. because he is the one extraordinary example of what leadership is. Yeah. Leadership, unlike what people think, is not facing your enemy. Because everybody is a hero face, or not everybody, most, most uh, generals will be heroes facing them. Leadership usually is facing your own people, telling them the things they don't want to hear, mm. and making them take the path they didn't want to take. Mm. And, and his was the kind of leadership you, you look up to. Um, facing them again and again and again. You know, I have my, my own theory that actually when God has decided not to let him into the country, to, the, the, to Israel, it wasn't a punishment. I know it's written as a punishment. Mm -hmm. I think he was his beloved son. And, and he was taking him for 40 years to this land of milk and honey. Yeah. But we know what Israel is really like. This is no land of milk and honey. This is a tough, tough place. So I think the Lord has decided in his grace to not to disappoint him with the, real, with the reality, but to let him think that he's just missed the word of milk and honey uh, because of some bad deed he, uh, many years before. But... But go back, going back to your question, he, he is, the, he is the, the figure I'm looking up to, trying to figure out what leadership he really is. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so you. much. It's a pleasure. God bless you pleasure. and God bless. lots of luck and uh, blessings Thank in you. everything you do. Thank you for listening to the Conversations with Yael podcast. If you like what you have heard, please check out my weekly podcast, Nourish Your Biblical Roots, that explores the Jewish roots of the Christian faith with inspirational and ancient teachings. You can also visit me at mybiblicalroots.org for more of my teachings, videos, blogs, and books. Follow me on Instagram at Yael underscore Eckstein or on Facebook at Yael Eckstein. Shalom and see you next month.